to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the bible says that the lord is not slow concerning his promises as some men count slowness but is long suffering toward us not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance we welcome you to our study of the subject of salvation as you've just heard from the bible verse that we mentioned the god of heaven jesus christ wants every person to be saved that's the heart that's the mind of god god doesn't want nor is it his desire that anybody would be lost and so today we're thinking about the second part in a study of the things the bible says are necessary in man's salvation in our previous lesson, as we discussed this subject, we noted that, that God was necessary for salvation, that Jesus Christ made it available, that the Holy Spirit played an integral part in that, and that salvation is given to man through the Godhead, that our faith is important, that faith only comes by hearing the Word of God, which is essential to our salvation that the preaching of the gospel and God's plan of salvation, all those things are indeed essential. Today we're going to notice some other things the Bible says are essential in man's salvation. And so we hope you'll get your, get your Bible and be ready to follow along with us as we think about these things. One of the things that the Bible indeed says is essential to salvation is the grace of our God. I want you to notice the words of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 with me. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. No doubt about the fact that grace is part in man's salvation. Without grace, there'd be no salvation. It's by grace that salvation is available. You know, that word grace is a, an interesting idea. You look at its root meaning and it carries the idea of undeserved or unmerited favor. God found favor in man, although man did nothing to earn or deserve that. God wanted to save man, although man was without hope and lost. Ephesians 2, 1, Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. And so it's God's good pleasure, His desire to save man. And friend, that grace is one of the most beautiful ideas that you find in the Bible. The exhibition of it, the showing of that grace is found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. John 1, 17 says, The law came through Moses, but grace and truth are in Christ. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we through His poverty might be made rich. Our God is the God of all grace, and therefore He has made that salvation available by His grace. And so we're saved by grace, and then as we've already mentioned, through faith. Faith is essential as well. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But you know, grace, that's God's part. God gave man His unmerited favor when man was completely hopeless and lost in sin. Man responds to that gift of grace in faith. That's man's part. We must obey God, Matthew 7, verse 21 following. And so we want to especially identify and, and show the richness of God's grace found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But friend, the Bible also teaches that another thing that saves us is God's mercy. Listen to the words of Titus chapter 3, verse number 5. The scripture records, It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. 
through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. I haven't earned it. I haven't merited it. I can't look up to heaven and say, God, I've done these things, therefore I deserve. No. Through His mercy, He saved us. You know, someone put a kind of a unique definition on that fits what the Scripture teaches about both grace and mercy. They said grace is when God allows us to receive what we don't deserve. That's His unmerited favor and His gift in His Son. Mercy is when God allows us to escape what we do deserve. How true that is. What am I being allowed to escape that I do deserve? Well, think about it for a moment with me. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Or Romans 3 verse 23. The Bible says, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 verse 23. The scripture says, the soul who sins shall surely die. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. And so when I think about the idea of mercy and man being allowed to escape what he deserved, I've sinned. You've sinned if you're of an accountable age. The, the wages, the reward of that sin is spiritual death and separation from God. Where's the mercy of God in salvation? The very fact that through the sacrifice of Jesus and the love of God, I don't have to get what I deserved for my sin. Psalm 103 verses 10 through 12, I think illustrates the mercy of God as beautifully as any verse in the scripture. The Bible says the Lord's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. What's that verse say? Exactly what mercy says. I didn't get what I deserved for my sins. How thankful I am to God for the fact that mercy is an integral part of God's salvation to mankind. But now let's think about another idea that goes right hand in hand with grace and mercy and is really the motivating factor of God's salvation. Friend, it is the love of God that is so essential to my salvation and yours. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why did God make salvation available? Friend, because God loves you and God loves me. 1 Peter 5, 7 says this, Cast all your care upon Him. He cares for you. While we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one might die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. Listen to this now. God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you. And how do you know that? Through the demonstration of His love. Well, what is that? Look at Jesus on the cross. Look at Jesus as He faced the suffering He faced. Look at Jesus as He was buried in the tomb. That's the demonstration of just how much God loves you and just how much God loves me. Were it not for the love of God, there'd be no salvation. I would be hopeless, helpless, lost, and headed down the road to destruction without the marvelous love of God. And friend, I'll assure you this. And we're talking about in a, in a, in a personal uh, sense. In a personal sense, I will assure you, no one has ever loved you like God loves you. No one has ever done more and given more and sacrificed more for your betterment and your salvation than God has. The fact of that alone, the fact of how much God loves me and how much He loves you ought to motivate us to want to be obedient to the God of heaven and spend eternity with Him in His salvation. Let's then turn our attention to another item that the Bible says is essential to salvation and that is the blood or the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want you to notice the words of Hebrews chapter 7 verse number 27. And the Bible says of Jesus who does not daily as those high priests, those under the Old Testament, need to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. Listen to this. 
For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Jesus gave his life, his blood, once for everybody for sin. Hebrews 10, 12 puts it this way. And this man, after he had made one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Well, what was that sacrifice? It was his own life. You remember the events surrounding uh, the cross of Jesus, uh, Calvary, Golgotha. Think about it in your mind for just a moment. Jesus is taken by ungodly men. He's bound by them. He's taken to be questioned in the praetorium. He's laughed at. He's mocked. People spit in His face. They take the hand and they strike Jesus. They, they, they beat him with a, something like a whip with large metal shards put in it or glass, bone maybe. His back is bloody. The blood begins to flow from Jesus. Uh, that, then a, a purple robe is placed on him, a crown of thorns piercing into his brow, reopening the wounds that have been beaten. His hands and feet are nailed to a cruel cross. He's suspended in agony between heaven and earth, and that blood of Christ that flowed down freely on Calvary is what saves me and you. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 26, verse number 28, Jesus, as He taught His disciples about the Lord's Supper, said, This is My blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. Without the blood of Christ, there is no salvation. It's what paid the price. It's the offering that appeased God's wrath and His uh, hatred for sin because of His Son's perfect life and sacrifice. Salvation could be available for mankind. And so Jesus' blood is such an important part of salvation. As I think about, as I think about what the Savior did for me, as I think about all the things He gave up, leaving heaven, coming to this earth, doing the, all the good that He did, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, helping the poor, casting out demons of those who were possessed. And then I think about that great sacrifice. How moved I am to want to live every day for Jesus Christ and to be thankful for the salvation that God has offered. But along with the blood of Christ, we also want to realize that the Bible says that the life of Jesus also played an integral part in salvation. I want to direct your attention to the words of Romans chapter 5, verse number 10. Listen to these words. Paul says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. It's the death that reconciles us, but notice He says we're saved by His life. Well, what about the life of Jesus that plays a, what part of His life is important to salvation? I understand His death, but how does Jesus' life save us? Well, friend, that life was a perfect life. And that life sets the pattern. And I have and you have, Christians have, that life to follow. And we are promised if we set the pattern of Jesus' life for us to follow, that's the life that will get us to heaven. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 21, For to this were you called, because Christ also suffered and died for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in His footsteps. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul said, Imitate me, as I also imitate Christ. If I'll have the mind of Christ, Philippians 2 verse 5, if I will try to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, study the life of Christ, deal with problems and situations and, and life and, and the devil and sin the way Jesus did, friend, that life will save you. That mindset, that attitude, and that caliber of life will ultimately lead to one doing the things that please God. And so the encouragement is, let's emulate the life of Jesus. Let's look at it as the premier example uh, of a life 
that is dedicated in service to God and a life that I need to hold up as a role model and follow every day. But you know, as you think about Jesus and His blood and His life, let's also realize, and I know we've mentioned this as well, but we want to surely make note that another thing the Bible says is so essential in salvation is the death of Jesus. Listen to Romans chapter 5, and I want you to notice what the Bible says about Christ's death. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 9, Much more than, having been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. What are we talking about when we say the blood of Jesus? The death, the sacrifice, the offering. And so we're justified and saved by the blood or the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The fact that He did not love His life more than He loved me, more than He loved you, and more than He loved God is a testament to the magnitude and the power of His salvation. Friend, we then mention this as well as it relates to salvation. The Bible teaches that the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ saves us. Notice Romans chapter 1. Verse number 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, listen now, for it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. W what is it that's the power of God to salvation? The gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of it. Why? The gospel is God's power to salvation. When we say gospel, that's a word that means, really in its basic sense, means good news. The good news of Jesus Christ is God's power to salvation. That good news, of course, we've mentioned many of the facets of it already. His life, His example, His death and His sacrifice, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 3. Friend, that's God's power to salvation. We don't want to underestimate the gospel of Christ. We read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the good news of the life of Christ. You can't have salvation without that good news. And aren't you thankful there's good news today? You know, there's so much negative in the world. There's so much negative on the internet. There's so much negative in television. You watch the news, whether it be international or national news, and the majority of that news, like it or not, is going to be negative. It's not good news. It's not something you turn on and you go, Woo, I'm glad to hear that. That's wonderful. No, that's not what we're talking about. But the gospel is good news. Oh, there's a problem. Man's sin, and man is in a state of death because of that sin spiritually. But the good news is this. You'll call His name Jesus. He'll save His people from their sins. And so how thankful to God we ought to be for the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now friends, sometimes people will understand these ideas that grace and mercy and the gospel and, and, and those things are essential in salvation, but they fail to realize the Bible also teaches that doing the will of God and obedience to God are also essential to salvation. How do we know that? Look in your Bible or notice Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21 with us. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven is doing the will of God essential. Is it an item the Bible says is essential to salvation? Yeah. Jesus said it's not everybody that just looks, look, looks up and says, Lord, Lord, I believe in God. No, that's not enough. I've got to do the will of my Father in heaven. Here's a question Jesus asked in Luke chapter 6 verse 46. He said this to the to the hypocritical people of his day who probably recognized he was a great teacher, maybe even savior, but weren't willing to follow him. Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? I want you to think about Jesus' words in John 14, verse 15 for a moment. 
Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Friend, let's realize Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9. In doing the will of God, in keeping the commands of God, which Jesus has taught us are clearly essential to salvation, can I then somehow reach the conclusion I've earned it? Of course not. We recognize salvation is by grace. Friend, do I not have to do what God says? Do I not have to obey God's terms? Do I not have to submit to God's will to receive the salvation that He's freely offering to mankind? Well, absolutely I do. And thus, obedience to the will of God is essential to salvation as well. You know, in line with that idea, Christians, the Bible teaches that Christians must live a righteous life to continue in the salvation God wants them to have. Listen to Matthew 5, verse number 20. Jesus said, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Can somebody be saved who's not living a righteous life? Can somebody be saved who's not walking in the light? 1 John 1 verse 7. Who doesn't have the mind of Christ? Philippians 2 verse 5. And who is not following in the footsteps of Jesus? 1 Peter 1, 2 verses 21 and 22. Well, of course not. Jesus taught us if our righteousness is just out there for people to see and we really don't mean it like the hypocrites and the Pharisees of His day, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. Friend, again, we're not saying any of us are perfect. We're not saying that it is our righteousness that earns us salvation. That is absolutely not true. But we are saying, the Bible says, we've got to live like God wants us to. The Bible says that we must walk in the light. And the Bible says we must live holy lives. 1 Peter 1 verse 15, Be holy as He who called you is holy. Hebrews 12 verse 14, Without holiness, no one can see God. And so I want to live my life in harmony with the will of God to the best of my ability and strive every day to be pleasing unto the Lord. You know, another thing, the Bible says is essential to salvation is being faithful unto the end or enduring to the end. Listen to the words of Matthew chapter 10, verse number 22. Jesus said, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Now notice this, But he who endures to the end will be saved. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Revelation 2 verse 10, if I quit halfway through, am I going to be saved? If I throw the towel in and give up, am I going to be saved? No. He who endures to the end, be faithful until death. To the very last breath I take, I've got to live up to the best of my ability and strive to do God's will. Again, we're not putting our salvation on ourselves, but friend, we do want to follow the will of God. We do want to live the best life we can, and we do want to strive to do those things which are pleasing unto our God. You know, as you think about salvation and as I think about salvation and God's plan of salvation, we realize that to be saved, we've got to put our trust and our hope in God who is the source of that salvation. I've got to turn from sin, from the error of my way, James 5 verse number 20. I've got to put my trust and hope in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4, verse number 12. It is His doctrine or His teaching that saves, 1 Timothy 4, verse 16. And I've got to be willing to look to God and to call on Him for salvation. Acts chapter 2, verse 21. The Bible says this, And it shall come to pass, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I've got to reach out to God. I've got to call out to God. I've got to put my trust in God to be saved. Now, what is, how, how does the Bible teach? How does the Bible tell us to call on the name of the Lord to be saved? Now, here's what the world says. The world says, 
to call on the name of the Lord just means that you look up in heaven and say, I believe in God, or maybe say the sinner's prayer, Lord Jesus, I recognize you as Savior and Master. I uh, now ask you to come to my heart and save me. Do you find those in the Bible? Is that what it means to call on the name of the Lord to be saved? No, let's let the Bible define its own terms. I want to direct your attention to a passage with me. Would you get your Bible and look in Acts chapter 22? And verse number 16 for a moment. Let's see an example of an individual who was told how to call on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 22, verse number 16. This is Saul of Tarsus, and he's recounting his conversion. It was the Lord who told him, you go into uh, go in the city and be told you what you must do. And here is what God told him. And now... And Ananias says to Saul, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, don't miss this, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. How do you call on the name of the Lord? Well, imagine it this way. If I'm in sin, if I'm in a predicament, if I'm in a problem, if I've got trouble, and there's somebody out there, and I call out to them for salvation, and they do things to offer, make that salvation available, then I've got to do what God says. I've got to do things also. I've got to follow what's said to be uh, saved and to do what God wants me to. Well, think about it this way. God's made salvation available. Man doesn't have to live in the muck and mire of sin. He can be saved. But to call on the name of the Lord properly, I've got to arise and be baptized and wash away my sins. Baptism is essential in calling on the name of the Lord. That's how the Bible defines the term call on the name of the Lord, by getting up and doing what God says to be saved. God's made it available. He's made it for everybody, but I've got to follow His will. You know, this is no different than what Jesus said in Mark 16, 16. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. No different than what Peter said, repent and be baptized, for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. And so we encourage you today to consider your own salvation. If you've not obeyed the gospel and done the things God wants, won't you do those and be saved so you can one day go to heaven? You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.